Ladies and gentlemen, let me open a regular city council meeting for Monday, November the 25th, year 2019. If you please rise, we'll have an invocation by Councilmember Moore, and Councilmember Little will lead us in the Pledges of Allegiance. I want to appreciate all of you being in the audience tonight as we move through our pre-Thanksgiving council meeting. Moving in our agenda to item number three, which is roll call. Our city council is here except for Council Member Perez. And we are here with our brights and shiny faces. Uh, moving to item four, citizen comments. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have three citizens that wish to speak tonight. I'll call you up in the order in which I received your request. First one is Rebecca Dunaway. Please come to the podium, state your name and address, and have three minutes. I'll let you know when you're down to 30 seconds. I'm Rebecca Dunaway, 2302 Cunningham Drive. It's in the Willow Crest subdivision. And last week, November on November 7th, we had a rain. It wasn't an intense rain. But my street was totally flooded. I wasn't able to get into my street because I couldn't put my car in, in danger of going through the water. Only three streets flooded in Willowcrest on November 7th. That's Halbert, Cunningham, and Lynn. So if it would have, <clears throat> the whole subdivision would have flooded. If it, it, it got to be a blockage. And Mr. Upton was kind <clears throat> enough to talk to, call me, and he said, I, and I believe I have trouble sometimes, I'm hard of hearing, so on the telephone I don't always understand. But I believe he said that the ditches in Macau had been clean. Well, I went by yesterday and the ditches on Macau were not clean. And I mean, I wash dishes this morning, I wash dishes this afternoon, I have a sink full waiting on me when I get home. So it's, you can't just wash dishes or remove leaves once a month and think that that's going to work. Every time it rains, my heart is right here in my throat because I'm thinking, if I'm in the house, that means I can't get out. If I'm out of the house, it means I can't get in. So that's a big turmoil in my life that I wish someone would truly check and see if there's a blockage, then fix it so that we don't have to live in this fear of every time one drop of rain falls. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Jimmy Davis, please come up to the podium. Okay, we'll wait for that item. Go ahead. Uh, Sean Murphy, please come to the podium. State your name and address. You have three minutes, sir. <laughs> Sean Murphy, 2335 North Texas Avenue. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'd like to first recognize the... I'm speaking on um, item H, which is the Pearland Neighborhood Center and the CDGB funding that we're getting for the expansion of our building. First of all, I'd like to recognize our board of directors uh, are here tonight um, to help support and thank council for their continued support um, with the Neighborhood Center. I'm currently the president of the board, um, and I'm here basically to uh, speak on behalf of the expansion. We currently service over 13,000 families last year, so the expansion of item H will help us build out 
the current building that we have to service more families. We currently use the space that we have as a food bank for people that need food, um, diapers and other things. So this expansion will allow us to hold more food that comes from uh, the Houston Food Bank. Myself, um, Constable Buck Stevens and Joel here, I really appreciate you allowing uh, the time for Joel to work with us on this. He's been a great help in coming in and helping us with the RFQ and what we've needed to do to put construction plans in place. We've enjoyed the continued relationship that we have with the city. And again, most of these folks that we do service in uh, the Pearland and Northern Brazoria um, area. So again, we hope to get this project done um, in 2020. We hope to start in January. And again, I just wanted to show our appreciation, our thanks for what, what council and staff has done. I'd like the board of directors to please stand back here. You'll hear it just. <clears throat> Thank you for your good work. Thank you, Mayor. I guess so. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. You. All right, Mayor, we have one other, but we'll wait till we get to that item. Moving in our, okay. Putting it back together there. Wait for the switch over. Moving in our agenda to item number five, which is public hearing number one. This is a little different. We do have public hearings at this point in our agenda. Okay, now we've got it on the screen, which is what I was waiting for. So with that information ready, this is the first public hearing is voluntary annexation, approximately 18 acres of land generally located east of County Road 48. And uh, Mr. Hardy, would you proceed with this? Thank you, Mayor, Council. Uh, this is the uh, first of two uh, scheduled public hearings for a voluntary uh, petition for annexation um, uh, from a property owner, uh, Bess Kingston. This property is located uh, at the address point uh, 2985 uh, County Road 48. Uh, it is uh, in the property ID code for the uh, Brazoria County Appraisal District um, 179014. And it's about 18.26 acres of uh, land in the ETJ uh, adjacent to our current uh, uh, city boundary. And uh, the petitioners have requested that we annex the property uh, as soon as possible. Um, this map provides a, um, the geographic location and boundary uh, for that address location. And we also provide the uh, future land use plan um, for that area, which is low density residential. There is a retail node located just south of that area on the corner of County Road 58 and County Road 40, uh, County Road 59 and County Road 48. Uh, before I go into the next steps, uh, we have uh, provided all the proper public notices uh, to the school district. We have also noticed other public entities that are required by uh, Chapter 43, and um, we are still held to uh, Subchapter uh, C3, as far as our annexation procedures or voluntary annexation petitions are concerned. Uh, so there are not many changes in that law, other than the fact that uh, we don't have to hold two public hearings any longer, but we'll do so for this annexation and proceed with the required one uh, for ones that we do in 2020, uh, calendar year 2020, that is. Uh, so we do have a scheduled second public hearing for December 9th. Um, between that time and the first reading of the ordinance, uh, staff will work with the property owner to develop the required service agreement, and we'll proceed with the readings of the annexation ordinances uh, sometime early in uh, fiscal year, uh, uh, the calendar year 2020. Uh, and there may be some zoning requirements that come in to be determined. Uh, with that said, I'll pass the balance back to council. Okay. Moving to item six on our agenda, which is staff review, which is what I think you have pretty well accommodated at this point. Unless additional individuals are going to. Moving then to item number seven, which is citizen comments. No comments from our community. And uh, moving to item eight, which is an opportunity for the city council and staff to continue their discussion. Starting with the city council. 
Uh, Member Orlando, would you give us your comments on this item? Nothing for me on this one, Mayor. Okay, Councilmember Carbone. Thank you, Mayor. So I know we've notified all the 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 uh, proper jurisdictions. What about the neighboring community to the north, uh, Southern Trails? Have we been able to reach out to maybe at least the HOA? Uh, we have not done that, and uh, Chapter 43 doesn't require that we do. Um, but um, if if Council is interested in <clears throat> making sure that we uh, inform those areas, I mean, there's a way we can go about doing that. I think it makes sense. Um, you know, we're notifying everybody else, and if staff's not comfortable, I'm happy to reach out to folks in that area. I may defer to Darren Coker and City Attorney. And as uh, Mr. Hardy just stated, obviously it's not a legal requirement uh, pursuant to Chapter 43. But if uh, Council desires uh, that uh, reach out, uh, we can reach out and uh, obviously notify the uh, HOA that's adjacent to that if the Council would like that. I would so desire, but I'll uh, see if anybody else would like to. That's all I had, Mayor. Okay, Member Little. Uh, I jumped the gun a little bit. Is there anyone that wishes to speak on this uh, public hearing? Anyone in the audience wish to speak on it? Uh, is is this uh, land uh, currently contiguous to the city limits? Uh, yes, sir. It's just south of uh, Southern Trails. Uh, so it's contiguous, contiguous to the southern border of that southern trail subdivision. And is it, it looks like from the aerial map, there's just one home with a couple of buildings located on 18 acres. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Fernandez. I really have nothing to, to add on this. It's voluntary. I think it's um, probably. Be straightforward. I don't know that it would have that big of an impact on anybody in the neighborhood right above it, but I mean, if it's a simple phone call or something, I, I'd be okay with notifying the HOA or something like that. So, thank you. I'd be okay with notifying Southern Trails. Other than that, I have no other comments. And Councilmember Owen. Yeah, I think it would be, since this property does back up to Southern Trails, I think it'd be a good idea maybe to reach out to them. And through this, it's just annexation has nothing come up on utilization on the track of land or anything else. That's it. Not at this time, Council. Okay. Yeah, I think then, you know, having said that, I think, you know, what the other two council members said, I think, you know, reaching out to Southern Trails will be uh, a good thing to do. One other thing real quick. Do we have uh, utilities down through there now or not? Uh, the... Um Current um, utility infrastructure locations are not far away. That's easy to connect to that property if they want any water. <clears throat> okay, so if he does develop down there, I guess he would have to bring the utilities down to that point. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. I complete your comments. Okay. Moving to staff discussion, uh, Mr. Hart. That wraps up my staff report, Mayor. Okay. And uh, item number nine, which would allow me the opportunity to adjourn this public hearing for this uh, particular item at uh, 6.59. And move to public hearing number two, and uh, public hearing number two, and ask, uh, we'll have just a short break while uh, Councilmember Lee has, uh, it's okay, we've got that up, okay, thank you. We have to shift from one, one particular presentation to another, so it's a little tricky sometimes. Number two, we have public hearing. Public, we receive public comments and testimony regarding plan amendment number five in the project plan and reinvestment zone financial plan of reinvestment zone number two. Do we have the staff member to move up here to council member? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you. Good evening, staff Mayor member, and Council. Um, I'll be presenting the information on this public hearing for Paraland Terz number two, the proposed fifth plan amendment. So uh, we're going to run quickly through the purpose of the proposed amendment. Uh, the current Terz plan for the particular projects involved in the plan amendment 
uh, the project details and estimates, as well as the amendment summary. Uh, so the TERS 2 plan amendment, the purpose is we have a, a, a couple of categories within the TERS where we're going to increase, uh, we're requesting that we increase the uh, budget based on the current scope of those projects. And uh, those increases are associated with the library project as well as the infrastructure projects. And the particular infrastructure project that uh, uh, we're adding funds to the TERS for in this instance is the expansion of FM 521 from FM 2234 or McCard Road, uh, Shadow Creek Parkway to State Highway 6. Um, both of these projects fit within the existing classifications uh, line items within the TERS uh, plan and budget. Uh, they complement the original TERS projects or enhance those. Um, so specifically what, what uh, the two amendments are doing is uh, on the library project, uh, we're looking at additional square footage on the library project to one, accommodate the Brazoria County tax office um, that is being sc scoped into the project and then uh, some additional uh, public meeting space that has been added to the program of the project. Um, Brazoria County Tax Office has been working with us on their portion of the project and is also budgeting uh, up to a million dollars to pre-finance their portion of the building as well. Uh, on the FM 521 project, uh, Fort Bend County, which is a TERS participant, has asked uh, for a portion of the funding for that project. Uh, the way that project is set up is that Fort Bend County uh, has an agreement with TxDOT where Fort Bend County is providing 100% of the engineering design work, and then the standard 10% of the right-of-way cost for the project, and then TxDOT is gonna manage and fund 100% of the construction. So what Fort Bend County has asked for is the pro rata share of the design money and the um, right-of-way money that is the local match, um, the pro rata share based on the frontage along FM 521 <laughs> Uh, that is within the bound or adjoining the boundaries of the TERS. So the, in the current TERS plan, the library is already in there uh, with uh, $18.25 million. And then the FM 521 improvements, uh, there's not any designated <coughs> funds towards that, but it falls under the existing category of infrastructure. So the project details and estimates, uh, the Shadow Creek Library is now uh, approximately 39,000 square foot including that additional uh, meeting space as well as the Brazoria County Tax Office. And this, of course, provides the permanent facility on the west side of town for the, the what is the current west side library within the uh, strip center next to the, uh, to the HEB. And, uh, of course, between that west side library and our Tom Reed Library on this side of town, those are the top two circulation libraries within Brazoria County. So... Uh, we definitely need the, the expanded facility out on that side of town. And then the FM 521 improvements. This is constructing a four-lane concrete boulevard uh, with raised medians between McCard, Shadow Creek Parkway, and State Highway 6. This is an extension of the current project, which is widening FM 521 between Beltway and McCard Road. And, uh, of course, this is a heavily traveled uh, two-lane road and um, definitely needed based on current traffic volumes and congestion along that route. So the TERS plan, the actual amendment to the TERS, uh, the, the amendment number five is an additional $5.25 million for the library and uh, $2.479 million for the FM 521 improvements for a total of $7.729 uh, additional uh, an add to the TERS plan. Um, according to the latest TERS um, estimates on where, where the, uh, uh, the increment we'll see over the life of the TERS, uh, both of these projects will be able to be covered um, based on the modeling of those, uh, that, those financials um, with some very conservative estimates included in there. So if there's any questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Thank you. That information in the record. Let's move now to item number well, which is citizen comments, Councilman Little. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this hearing, public hearing number two? Anyone in the audience wish to speak on this? Third and final time, anyone wishing to speak on public hearing number two? One there. Okay, number 13, item 13 on our agenda will be an opportunity for the city council and staff 
to uh, provide discussion about the issues that we have just discussed. We'll start with the City Council, and that would be Councilmember Owens. Mayor, I think we've been over these, and uh, I think the uh, city has done a good job on bringing these projects out through the tour, so I think that's good. I think 521 is going to be a good north-south for everybody all the way down to Highway 6 back up. Uh, so I think that that's key. And, of course, we've already approved for the uh, uh, library in that area over there, and that's going to be a, a good one. And uh, I didn't know Stacy was chipping in money on that one. So thank you, Stacy. Appreciate it. <laughs> so, but that, that's all I have to say. It's, it's a good okay. deal. Okay. Complete. Confirm Hernandez. Thank you, Mayor. I had uh, most of my questions answered already, or all, all of my questions rather, uh, by staff prior to the meeting. I'm just happy to see that we're moving forward with the library and um, getting that done. 521. I take some times to avoid <laughs> going down to. 288 on the Beltway, so I'll be happy for that as well, even though that means it's also going to be under construction. <laughs> so, But I'm happy to see that we're doing these. Okay. You're smiling, huh? Okay. Jump in a little. No comment. Council Member Carbone. Thank you, Mayor. Just to clarify, so the uh, in terms of the, the, the position for reimbursement, it's the first project that's completed. So the way the reimbursement works is we'll do the uh, letter of financing agreement, which we've done several of them on the first projects we're working on. And once you complete the project and you turn in all the paperwork required to the TERS, and that once that is audited and they complete their audit, uh, then, you, then you are in line for reimbursement. So it's really once you've completed the project, turned in all the paperwork, and, and they've audited those, those, that paper. And I guess what's the estimated completion date on the library versus 521? I mean, at some point, the the TERS is going to run out. I know pro projections are we'll, there'll be enough value to reimburse 100%. Yeah, yes, sir. Projections are that all of these projects will be able to be um, reimbursed at 100%. Uh, the library, of course, we're well into design on that, looking to go under construction within the next year. Um, so we'll be completed with that in 2021. Uh, the um, FM 521 project is a little bit further out from that. They've still got to do land acquisition and complete their design and all those things. So, so we'll beat them to the punch. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Orlando. Uh, glad to see these projects getting in the queue and nothing further from me. All right. Staff discussion on this? Well, then. No, no further comment from staff on this. Then I'll move to adjournment of the public hearing number two at uh, 709. Both of these items, you'll see again, we're, they're working their way through our legislative process for the council and uh, development, and uh, they will be on future agendas for you to be if you're interested in these particular two items. Moving in our agenda, down to item number 15, which is a what we call our consent agenda. And uh, are there any items to be removed from consent agenda? None stated. It's, it's aye. Letter. Aye. Yeah. Moving aye. And uh, what was yours? Huh? I H and L. Okay. Let me mark that down here. I H and L. Now, remember, Alondo, would you place this on the table for us, with the exception of I H and L? Consideration of possible action of consent agenda. Uh, all items excluding H I and L. So moved. Second. We have a motion and. And a second, Madam Secretary, I believe we have a motion secretary on the floor for it. Councilmember Orlando? Aye. Councilmember Carbone? Aye. Councilmember Little? Aye. Councilmember Hernandez? Aye. Councilmember Moore? Aye. Councilmember Owens? Aye. Motion passes 6-0.
Let me switch the sequence on this. Would you do H first? <laughs> Consideration and possible action resolution number R2019-281, so moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Have been in discussion, staff report. Uh, and, uh, Sir, good evening, Mayor and Council. Happy Thanksgiving week. Um, item H is a uh, recommendation for entering into agreement using federal uh, community development block grant funds uh, that the city's uh, entrusted with uh, and distributing. And this is in accordance with uh, many public hearings and plans and budgets for those CDBG funds. Uh, we're very proud to be representing and, and recommending that uh, we move forward in uh, cooperation with the Pearland Neighborhood Center. Uh, for an expansion of their facility. The city does own that uh, property. Um, that was first step, a longstanding partnership where we support that. Um, and But they are, uh, their good works have, have led them to uh, run out of space there. And so uh, we've identified this uh, need for a small, relatively small expansion uh, so that they can do the, continue their work. And this uh, agreement facilitates that. Nothing to add. Council, have a question or comment based on staff report? Yeah, I, I just wanted to be safe and disclose that I'm a, a volunteer board member along with member Perez on the Paraline Neighborhood Center Board. No financial stake or anything, but just wanted to disclose and express my uh, strong support for an awesome organization that fills a critical gap in, in services in our community. Uh, and we are very grateful for that. Any other question or comment from Council? I think. Uh, Paraly Neighborhood Center does great stuff, and so I thank everybody for being here tonight. Really appreciate it, and hope that this helps to do even more good stuff. And thanks, staff, for all your help getting this done too. The other council member coming, Mayor. They're going to take you one cell out that used to be the jailhouse. That's terrible. It's history. <laughs> uh, Laurels to our audience here tonight. Hearing none, uh, uh, hearing further comments from the City Council, Mr. Uh, Madam Secretary, I believe we have more second on floor. Councilmember Orlando? Aye. Councilmember Carbone? Aye. Councilmember Little? Aye. Councilmember Hernandez? Aye. Councilmember Moore? Aye. Councilmember Owens? Aye. Motion passes 6 to 0. Councilmember Orlando, would you do item I? Consideration of possible action resolution number R2019-287, so moved. I have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Staff report. Thanks, sir. Uh, the city has uh, operated our Natorium and Recreation Center for uh, a number of years successfully. Uh, this particular recommendation is something that's been uh, budgeted and uh, improving the timing system. Uh, we have a continual flow of events we host, uh, and probably with that, uh, uh, that we rent out the facility. Uh, but to keep up and to stay competitive with that, uh, we need this uh, timing system, and this is done through a buy board, and uh, this is eligible for the uh, cost participation with the school uh, district per our agreement with them. Nothing to add. Also, have any questions on this based on staff report? Yes, I do, Mayor. Um, so, uh, how long is this um, system lifespan? The building's 10 years, so I, don't, I assume it's uh, original, so gotten a good decade's use out of it. Uh, no, this new system that we're... Oh, how long would that go? Yeah. I'm sorry. Good afternoon, Council Member Moore. The estimated lifespan that Mr. Pearson just mentioned about 10 years is pretty industry standard. One of the reasons that we lean towards the Colorado system is we've seen this in application in several other agencies beyond that 10-year lifespan and not showing any sign of wear. So we're hoping this is a, an exercise in longevity as well. Um, one of the more popular was the University of Houston utilizing this system, and they're in, I believe it was their 13th or 14th year of utilizing it. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Any further comment from Council at this point? This won't fall under a shared deal with the school district, will it? As I yes, mentioned, sir. it does. It does? It's over fifteen thousand uh, yeah. dollars. So uh, we've already been talking to them. We may be coming to you with uh, alternate means, but that'll be up to the council at, at another time. Whether it's some value to the city equivalent to that. So. Good. I right. appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I believe we have a motion second on the floor. Councilmember Orlando. Aye. Councilmember Carbone. Aye. Councilmember Little. Aye. Councilmember Hernandez. Aye. 
Council Member Moore? No. Council Member Owens? Aye. Motion passes five to one. Consideration of possible action resolution number R2019 277. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Staff report. Thanks, sir. Uh, from time to time, we uh, uh, probably annually, we come to you and uh, uh, recommend list of uh, banks that we work with uh, for our investments. Uh, this recommendation is to uh, narrow and streamline that a bit so we just uh, don't need that, uh, that many in, in the stable that we can work with. Um, and so that's what this uh, resolution does. So nothing to add. <laughs> does staff have any comment or questions based on the staff report? Hearing none, uh, Madam Secretary, we've got a motion second on the floor. Council Member Orlando? Aye. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Council Member Little? Aye. Council Member Hernandez? Aye. Council Member Moore? Aye. Councilmember Owens. Aye. Motion passes six to zero. Moving into our agenda, if you uh, have a copy of the agenda, you can follow me on this. Uh, moving to item 16, matters removed from the consent agenda because we had three and we just addressed all three of those. Moving to item 16, I mean uh, 17, new business. Councilmember Carbone, would you present item number one for our consideration? Thank you, Mayor. Consideration possible action first reading of ordinance number 1585. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Staff report. As Mr. Representative led you through on the public hearing, this is the actual uh, first reading of the ordinance to facilitate those amendments to the uh, uh, TERS project number two. And uh, that's been very successful uh, from every standpoint. Uh, this adds additional public improvements in that area with the, uh, expanding further the library project and then working on uh, FM 521 on our western border uh, with Fort Bend County to make that road improvement. Okay. Does the um, staff have, uh, council member have any question or comment based on staff report on that item? Secretary, we've got a motion second on the floor for this item. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Council Member Little? Aye. Council Member Hernandez? Aye. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Owens? Aye. Council Member Orlando? Aye. Motion passes six to zero. Council Member Little, would you present item two? Thank you, Mayor. Consideration and possible action. First reading of ordinance number 1586. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second word discussion. Staff report. And as Mr. Hardy outlined in his public hearing, uh, this is a uh, 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 property owner's request to uh, annex this property into the city limits uh, just south of uh, Southern Trails on the east side of the road and uh, recommend your consideration to move this forward as well. Staff, have any comment or question regarding the staff report? Is that the first item? I'm sorry. We're on number two? Yes. Thought so. Item. Okay. Now, number one. I apologize. Was I saw, um, you're right. I saw Southern Trails and jumped ahead. So, uh, what, it, 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 forget everything I just said. Uh, this is uh, actually, um, so there's two uh, planned developments. One is uh, Southern Trails planned development, and the other one's uh, Stonebridge um, in, off of Palin Parkway. Uh, there's amendments that have been proposed to those planned developments, and uh, rather than trying to uh, burden the, the applicant with uh, individual notices to all the property owners, which would be uh, into the hundreds, if not thousands, of notices individually, uh, and we've done this in the past, uh, we're proposing a, uh, uh, an alternate means where we would uh, provide publication and notice to the Homeowner Association to achieve very much the same effect. Uh, for this. So you're not uh, proving or making decisions about the plan development amendments themselves. This is just to uh, sanction an alternate means of publication from what would normally be prescribed because of the scale of these plan developments. All right. Thank you. Often we've done this in the past. We did one, oh, Darren or somebody. 
I was here. Yeah. The, the last, I know we did one in 2015 when we did the Bailey Road annexations and we brought those properties in. Uh, in addition, when we've, uh, we've done on at least two occasions where we did broad, wide sweeping zone changes when we uh, made, made modifications in the UDC and we adopted a new zoning map, we did the same thing there. We did publication by notice. And just to clarify, just so the council's aware, uh, the notice in the paper will be just the same as it always would be. Uh, the only different notice here is that um, it's going to be going to the 200 foot barrier that we normally provide notification to. It will be within 200 feet of the subject property here as typical. What it, what it doesn't mean is that we have to go 200 feet outside the boundaries of the entire PD and then give individual notice to every single resident within the PD. It, but it does still provide a 200 foot notice barrier, uh, but it's specific to the property that the change would apply to if adopted. But to answer your question, I believe there's been at least two and possibly I think a third occasion where we've d adopted the alternate notice similar to this. So just looking at the, the map, it looks like it's the, the property line north of Broadway where there would be a majority of uh, homeowners that would technically be affected by the zone change? If you can say they're affected? I, I don't see anything, I don't see like neighborhood, a lot of neighborhood, a lot of neighborhoods south of that, but there are some. Well, it'd be all of Southern Trails is the PD technically. So when you're talking about like, sections within that neighborhood or yeah are you talking about if we did our standard typical notice yeah i'm talking about the whole red bordered area of of this right that would include every single resident within uh the neighborhood yeah i'm just saying that there's more residential on north of broadway than i guess looking at the map here that's south of the develop south of the uh area that's to be um changed I don't know if you can put the map up. Uh, I, 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 yes, as I see it, but the properties to the north are not within the boundaries of the PD. Right. Right. Okay. Somebody here. Any other questions coming from council? Madam Secretary, I believe we've got a motion second on the floor sitting here. Council Member Little? Aye. Council Member Hernandez? Aye. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Owens? Aye. Council Member Orlando? Aye. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Motion passes 6 to 0. Moving in our agenda to item number 3, Council Member Hernandez, would you put on the floor for us? Yes, sir. Consideration possible action resolution number R2019 284. So moved. Second. We have a motion. I heard a second, I believe. We're in discussion, staff report. Thank you. So as, out, as outlined in the uh, admit, uh, the packet and the uh, prior Thursday packet, uh, we have uh, improvements to our Bailey water plant facility uh, that includes uh, the ground well. And uh, uh, we've come across an opportunity, I believe, to uh, uh, go further with the improvements and uh, further um, improve the water quality for the long haul. Uh, we're also working this in tandem with Magnolia uh, Pump Station, and so all told, uh, this am in amendment is for the engineering to facilitate uh, this uh, as we recommended in, in the packet there. Nothing to add beyond Does that. Does Council have any question or comment on this item based on staff report? I do, Mayor. I think uh, Trent's already answered some of it, but... Can you put up the uh, screen on there on uh, page 6 of 40? I think we're in a little tr trouble with the projections, but we'll oh. get over that. There you go. Yeah, I, I guess uh, part of the discussion was to date, we're showing that uh, we spent 620000 and is that true? Uh, and then uh, 4240000 that's what we spent to date so far on this project? Not spent. Those are the funding sources. That's what? 
Those are the funding sources, the bond issues. Yeah. Yeah, that's two so bond issues. Yeah. Below is the expenditures. Yeah. And, uh, well, we're still looking at the uh, design construction 380-76. And then uh, is, that's just what we approved on the tank construction of 1.5. Correct. That's phase one. Okay. All right. So altogether, we're looking at total expenditures of nine, a little over nine million. But we're running a project balance contingency of 4.2 million on this project. That's the net. I mean, Trent can describe that. We, we talked about that in the memo, too. But Sure. So as described in the memo, this was the original uh, budget and right. project to do the Bailey uh, water well to treat the, the, the uh, manganese and, and iron issues we have there with a treatment system. Uh, when we pilot tested that at the, mag at the Bailey well, um, we also had an opportunity to pilot that at the Magnolia well, which has a different issue. However, that treatment process worked very well on our issues there at Magnolia. Um, so where this project just initially included treating uh, the water at the, at the Bailey well, um, this now would expand that to take care of the Magnolia well as, uh, also, which we were, at the time, we were still scoping that project, so had not put together a full budget or plan for that project, but just opportunity here to go ahead and, and have it all treated and dealt with at one location. Um, so we've got one location to maintain and operate as we move forward. Um, so that's the recommended, recommended action here is to go ahead and do the engineering for that portion of it. Um, the, the budget there, the estimates on construction are still estimates at this point. We've got to refine those further as we move forward through the design. And then we'll bring that back at, at our mid-year or when we're ready to award a contract to adjust the, the capital okay. budget. Um, also go to uh, 10 of page 40. Page 10 of 40. Does that complete your comments? No, I, I need to see one more. <laughs> Give me 10 or 19, there you go. On that one, uh, I think you mentioned those to me today. We got two subs on there here locally. On that, is that the one that uh, when I sent it up there to you, we had two. I was asking who the sub consultant were on this project. Yes, sir. There's a sub consultant doing the geotech work as well as the electrical work. It's uh, Rob Kistner on the geotech. And Cl I don't know how to say it. Clois Versep. Yeah. Okay. On the electrical. All right. So that's where we're at. We got. Uh, well, I, was, I was just looking at the contract going back to over on that work authorization up there to the description of work. We got uh, four areas up there. And it's looked like four different work authorizations that have already been approved. No, sir. That description of work there is for this professional service contract amendment, which is amendment number one to the existing contract. This is what is before you right now as far as the amended amendment to the existing contract. So those four items add up to the total amended amount right. of 152850 Okay, so we're going to end up with a contract of 525300 and something. And that's the best accounting we got right now? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, I was just looking for some clarification what I saw on there. I need to get that on there, but I appreciate you digging that up this afternoon, too. Thank you. I have a question. We're spending about $1.6 million on construction of the tank for this project and almost $7 million on pretreatment construction. Can you kind of tell me a little bit about what pretreatment construction is? Councilman Little, thank you for the opportunity to address that. Address that. Um, we're looking at what's called a green sand filter system that will take out the iron and manganese and then also uh, the constituents at the magnolia well. And so that is a process that uh, binds and takes away the iron and manganese and binds it up in a media. And then after that media starts to get exhausted, we refresh it by back flushing and taking that water to the sanitary system, and then we put the service back in. So uh, that's a treatment process, 
and we'll have electrical components, uh, monitoring, SCADA, et cetera, to uh, optimize and run those two wells um, and treat that water. And it's set up for, uh, with both these wells, it'll be about 3,000 gallons a minute. Okay, and this will be treating the water that surface water? This is groundwater, sir. So it's ground two water. groundwater wells that um, two, of the, uh, two of the 11 wells we have in the system. We also have two surface water take points from the city of Houston, and then also our surface water treatment plant. This is uh, long-term needs uh, that are needed to maintain peak day and also max day demands uh, as we proceed forward as our city grows. So the water we purchased from Houston will not be going through this filtration process? No, sir. It's, I guess, assume that it's already gone through their filtration process? Yes, sir. Thank you. And just to clarify the, the purpose and, you know, why we're going through this additional treatment process is this is an area where we've had, um, you know, one of our higher areas of, of water quality complaints. And so this is part of uh, the different tools that we're using to address those, and this addresses it at the source water. Mm -hmm. Any other council questions? or, or and since this is going to, should address um, some of those issues, I, I see in here con uh, proposed construction completion of June of 21. Is that correct? As of right now, that's the anticipated schedule based on very, very early preliminary design. Um, and we'll continue to monitor that through, but that is um, working with our consultant. Okay. If there's anything we can do to speed that up that's not costly, I think everybody in that area would appreciate it. Yes, sir. Any other question? If council questions or comments, any remarks? I got one, and I don't know where I should ask it or not. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, the the plant surface water plant we're building over is ten million gallons a day uh, water plant. What is the best estimate we have of the cost of that plant? The best estimate now. Yeah, I, I think that's information we can provide to you. It's not. It's not something we're. It's not part of this agenda item, so I don't think we have that right in front of us. Yeah. Okay. And the reason I'm asking that, and probably you of all people would probably know, uh, the one in Missouri City, of what that cost during the time since you were there. I think it was about twenty three or twenty four million, is what uh, uh, previous mayor uh, Alan Owen told me. I think it was significantly more than that and very different parameters from our yeah. project as well. Okay. So we can provide information. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish you could just, you know, provide something on that, just, you know, of the, where it's at. I mean, it's pretty significant what we're, we're going to be spending uh, on that and uh, from the Texas Water Board uh, money that we were borrowing. So, yeah, I just want to find out roughly. About it, and so we can watch the the dollar amounts and see where we're at, see where we stand. Regularly scheduled Thursday packet memo on that is in the review process right now. Appreciate it. Thank you. <coughs> Last call for comments or questions. Hearing none, Madam Secretary. Number three is motion second on the floor. Council Member Hernandez. Aye. Council Member Moore. Aye. Council Member Owens. Aye. Councilmember Orlando? Aye. Councilmember Carbone? Aye. Councilmember Little? Aye. Motion passes six to zero. Moving in our agenda to item number four, Councilmember Moore, would you do the honor? Thank you, Mayor. Consideration possible action resolution number R2019 268, so moved. Second. I hear a motion second on that. Yes. We have a motion and a second. We're on this in discussion. Staff report. Thanks, sir. We have uh, two renewals uh, for uh, hauling as part of our, our water, wastewater uh, operations. Uh, and this one's the first one's to Sprint Waste. We bid that. And uh, uh, again, this is a renewal of a contract that's been in place and they continue to perform well for us. So nothing to add. We've got one citizen watching. Huh? One citizen mayor would like to speak on this item. Jimmy Davis, come up to the podium, please. Give us your name, address, and limit your discussion to three minutes, please. Jimmy Davis, 5004 Combsnell Street, Pearland 77584. Okay, um, some of my friends joke, they call me the environmental conservative. 
I'm pretty conservative, and usually people don't think of conservatives and environmentalists. I'm a little bit of both. My philosophy is we all have a responsibility to leave the world a better place, both for you know our kids, but also for Mother Earth. To this, to this extent, this is a one-year contract extension. I'm grateful it's not a five-year contract. I would ask the city of Pearland to look into, uh, I work full disclosure for waste management, the trash company. I work in a division called sustainability services. Our focus is how to be more sustainable. Let's find better ways to get rid of stuff. Don't just put everything in the ground. Uh, Sprint Waste Services, phenomenal company. They do a great job. I have friends that work for them. Um, to that end, I would ask the city of Pearland to take the next year. Yeah, we got to get rid of this stuff. We don't have an option right now. I would encourage the city of Pearland to look into especially EPA Rule 503 as it pertains to beneficial reuse for biosolids. Um, biosolids, if it meets certain parameters and there's analytical testing requirements uh, that you have to do to verify if it will, but it can be a very beneficial, it's actually called beneficial reuse. It's a great fertilizer. Uh, crops, you can use it to fertilize even like parks, whatnot, but to maybe look at, is this an option? Because if there are any farms, any places around that could actually use it, if the biosolids is acceptable quality, that they can use it in lieu of another fertilize, instead of this becoming a cost, yeah, you have the cost of, get, of putting it in a roll-off box and transporting it to them, but all of a sudden, instead of paying whatever it is, $30, $40 a ton to get rid of this stuff, you now actually have a commodity that a farmer might actually buy. So I would just encourage us over the next year, let's look at that. Let's see if we can run the testing, spend a couple thousand dollars to see if it meets the requirements that, yeah, we can actually get it out there and do something beneficial instead of just put it in a hole in the ground. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think we've been through staff report on this, haven't we? Uh, yeah. uh, I know what you're talking about. When I was with the city of Houston, it was called Hue Act Tonight, and the sludge was dried and sent to Florida for the uh, orange uh, growth down there. Uh, and so they sold it down to, to Florida for the Farmers for the oranges and what have you. It's called Hue Act tonight when they've done that. I took a little bit home with me one time, put it on my front yard, and uh, when it rained, people that were out walking, they'll walk all the way across the street on the other side and come down because it activates, you know, the smell and everything. But it was, it, it's very good. I don't know if the city of Houston is still doing it or not, but they, that's how they used to do it. They, they would take it, dry it, and then ship it down to Florida, and Florida would buy it. Uh, through that down there, but it's uh, it's something quite a bit. The the other thing that I didn't have, and uh, I don't know, it probably this is not known right now, but um, given the the cost of this, how much did we use basically the uh, same amount last year on that? Was it in last year's budget? And how much we used uh, as far as the dollar amount? Does anyone know that? Yes, sir. That information is included in the um, in the AR. There was three hundred ten thousand dollars used last year. Okay, yes. that was um, yeah. I appreciate doing that because that gives us some insight of what we're spending now versus what we've actually spent last year. Yes. So, I appreciate you doing that. That's all, Mayor. Appreciate it, boy. Any other comment by Council? Yes, Mayor. Um, Mr. Coker, what's our uh, policy on doing anything like that. Have we ever done anything like this? I mean, we have a responsibility from cradle to grave. I mean, we put this out somewhere and then there's a problem with it and somebody gets sick or whatever, then they're coming back to Pearland because they got deep pockets and pending lawsuit. Uh, We'd have to look into that further as far as specifically with respect to the biosolids. Uh, the, the only pilot program I'm aware of that we did at one point in time several years ago, and it's been close to 20 years ago now, 
we actually experimented with uh, a grease trap uh, waste and, and, and recycling grease trap waste uh, in our uh, plants. But uh, that that was a short experiment, lasted less than a year, and that was the last time I remember doing any type of pilot program like that. So we'd have to look into this further to see what the feasibility would be and uh, what any limitations that exist would be. Okay, I guess this is a question for, I don't know, Robert, Clarence, somebody. What what percent um, solids are we pressing and going? It just all depends on the day and how the equipment's running. But we run anywhere from 18 to 23 percent. We're keeping, you know, of course, we're using both belt presses and centrifuges, again, depending on whichever one is actually running that day. Um, just a couple of notes, we are expanding two of our plants. We'll be getting some new sludge drying equipment at those facilities. And as the plants expand, we'll get more detention time, which will allow us to actually look at beneficial reuse, because that's one of the big components of that. It has to be in the system a certain amount of time for the treatment before we can reach that class for the beneficial reuse. So here in the very near future, we might actually be capable of looking into this. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comment from Council? I've got one. This kind of relates to agenda item number five. What's the difference in a dewatered biosolid and sludge? So the dewater biosolid would be the one that we actually run through the centrifuge and bring it up to either 18, 23% solids, maybe slightly higher depending again how well we're running it that day. And then the, the sludge or we call it liquid hauling or wet hauling, Typically, that is literally they put the vector truck to the, the big vacuum tanker truck to the tank, pull it out wet, and either haul it to the landfill or one of our other own facilities where we will then press it there because we actually do haul from one facility to the other where we do have equipment to dry. So that's, that's the big difference there. When we talk about sludge or liquid hauling, literally like it sounds, it's almost 96% or more water. When we talk about... They're both biosolids, but one is dewatered, as you mentioned. So when we talk dewatered, that's a cake, similar to what Councilman Owens was talking about that we made in Houston, the Hue Act tonight. A little bit different. One's pelletized, but they're both dry. And so, I, unless I'm missing on here, is there is there a cost for for that for the solidification at the landfill? Am I missing that cost, or do we even have a cost for that? We could get that for you, but the way our contracts are actually written up with them, this cost that you're seeing in these contracts is, to, is a total turnkey. That includes the disposal if there is a need for solidification, uh, whatever results they may get from the paint filter test, things like that. But it is all wrapped up in these as a total. Okay, thank you. Any other council questions or comments? Madam Secretary, I believe we have a motion second on the floor here. Councilmember Moore? Aye. Councilmember Owens? Aye. Councilmember Orlando? Aye. Councilmember Carbone? Aye. Councilmember Little? Aye. Councilmember Hernandez? Aye. Motion passes six to zero. Moving into our agenda to item number six, Councilmember Orlando. Consideration and possible action resolution number R2019 291, so moved. Second. Motion and a second. We're in discussion. Staff report. Thank you, sir. Uh, one of the projects that was included in the voter approved uh, May 19 bond issue, we'd done the preliminary engineering review. Uh, and this, I believe, gets close to, if not the final one, where we're actually moving into engineering already. Uh, this would provide the professional services for the design of this building. It's uh, a relatively small amount compared to a lot of other construction projects we have. Uh, but it is very uh, specialized. I mean, it's. Uh, you, jump, you jumped ahead again. Dang it. He's, I thought you said 291. For clarification, what was read was 291, which yeah. he's doing. We just missed, skipped right over uh, number five. So Can't claim all that one. So yeah. <laughs> so I think 291 was read in. Do you want me to? That's correct. Want to continue on that one and go back to? Wait two. You going on this? So uh, again, just for clarity, we're on number six on the agenda. And this is uh, Resolution 291. Uh, and as mentioned, this is the design services contract. Uh, and this is a specialized building, uh, a big leap forward uh, for our uh, fire training. As uh, has been stated in the background memos, these are infrequent but high risk 
uh, situations that we need to train for. Uh, this is uh, uh, different than our existing uh, training tower, whereby this one would actually be a burn building uh, built towards that, that we could uh, actually uh, light and, and uh, smoke and, and create different kinds of scenarios, has uh, pitched roofs and other kinds of situations simulated. So, uh, uh, you know, we'll be providing our staff a uh, big leap forward with uh, training for that. Uh, the firm that's recommended, uh, that's what they do for a living. Uh, they're based in Virginia, but we'll be using technology to uh, loop them in uh, when they need to uh, for the, the progression of this. Uh, and uh, so recommend your consideration that going forward. Council have any question or comment on this item from based on staff report? Owens? I guess this is one uh, experience we spoke about earlier. And I'm trying to get down here. I think I'm on page uh, 43. I had some concern with uh, this company uh, out of Virginia. And the one doing our uh, civil side is out of Dallas. And it looks like we're using this virtual stuff all the way through uh, this of, of not coming down here. They're going to be designing it oh, yes. there in that uh, location in Virginia. And we really don't have anybody locally doing it on site. Okay. But there was some, uh, it looks like on there that they uh, only scheduled about two meetings uh, in Fairland while they're doing that. And uh, that's kind of a you know, of a concern, but, and then when I go through and I look at uh, what they're looking at and what they're talking about on there of, of uh, during this uh, design, and once it goes to construction, they're not uh, held accountable for anything on there. And I, I, you know, that, to me going through, it's not that big of a project, but getting still, uh, it's a concern, I mean, of, of the two elements, I think the geotech is here local on there, but uh, the people doing the design for the uh, facility and then the, the uh, civil, which is in in the Dallas area, I'm kind of wondering, you know, we, we don't have those capabilities here local. That was my big concern on this is, is the local aspect of it. I'll turn over to Trent, but, you know, as I said, uh, this is very specialized and uh, you know, we don't want somebody that doesn't have the right experience to uh, put up something that you know we're going to be putting our people on top of, uh, inside of, um, you know, in these kinds of situations. Uh, you know, we, it, it's pretty st straightforward in terms of uh, you know having the technology that we can loop them in. Um, you mentioned the uh, uh, accountability. That's like any single one of our contracts, whereby you know the architect designers design it, and then we have separate construction inspection to make sure that the contractor you know, builds it to design. They're responsible for the design. They're not responsible, like any of our contracts, for a, uh, you know, what the contractor does out in the field. That's a different aspect, as you know. Well, if you go down to page 26, and item number three, and the uh, EL and M company, which is doing the design, shall not uh, supervise, direct, or have any control over the contractor is work have any responsibility for the construction means method, uh, is sequencing of work or anything. So um, they're shedding the, any kind of responsibility from themselves. And I don't know on the daily inspection, is that, you know, inspections, is that our people in the field going to do the inspections? So, so again, that's a, that's a fact with any of ours. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Trent, but uh, all they're saying is that the architect's not going to be responsible for contractor that, that's correct and that, that this is in oh. several of our design contracts and you know that's that's just like us if we were to supervise direct or can try to control the contractor's work our contract doesn't allow for that either um so, so you know minute, we, we, the, the the engineers never have direct control over the contractor's work the contract i'm not saying that you know that they have control but if they put in a bad design it's got to come back on somebody. Don't come back on us and don't come back on the contract. Well, they, they are responsible for the design. They will sign and stamp those with their professional yeah. credentials. That's not what that be responsible says. It says yes. nothing about they're not they're responsible for their design, not for the contractor. That's exactly right. 
but I can't see any. I mean, it, they kind of alleviate themselves from the from the whole process, as in that item number three on there. Uh, I believe just, that alleviates them from any failings of the contractor, and if the contractor fails to perform, the contractor does not follow the design. Um, then it is the contractor's fault. It is not go back on the design engineer. Okay, well, and the thing, the other part about it, they, they're only coming down twice. They get a 60% design review and a 90% design review, but they only come to Houston twice, or excuse me, not Houston, but, but Pearland. Twice has only ever come down on that, and I guess y'all are doing it through telephone calls or video or whatever of reviewing the plans. they got to come here to, I mean... And, and they already did the preliminary work, uh, the preliminary work on this project to get it prepared for the bond package. And uh, that process worked very well um, with our design team and our you know, fire department participation in that. And uh, being able to work through that, there was no issues with communication or our meetings. Yeah, and then if you look on 24 and 42, it says that uh, the civil side, it says to be on level, pre-prepared site in Fairland. Who's the one doing the leveling and prepared the site? Can, and this is their civil person. Is Can you? It's on uh, page 24 or 42. Which item? I don't know now. I'm going to have to go back in and look. Uh, I don't know. I pulled that off of there. Provide the design exception for low and down to the building placed on a site in Pearland. The burn building will be two-story reinforced concrete structure on a fire training facility utilizing that, and the structure will be approximately 2,800 square feet. But it says in, in there that it's going to be put on a level site, and I'm, I certainly hope so. Well, we, we do have the site. That at from the civil side. We do have the site at the fire administration building, and yep. so that we basically do have an existing leveled site, and then we'll do the geotech work as well that'll direct the design for the structural and the foundations. Yeah, well, you're still going to do some site work, right? Yes. I mean, you're just not going to go out and mark off the uh, square footage out there and start building the building on top of it without coming in and doing some kind of level work and doing the geotech work with foundation and stuff like that. Geotech work will derive, d direct the structural foundation of the building and then that will go into the plans and then we'll excavate, the contractor will excavate or do whatever prep work is required for the foundation. Mm -hmm. And I guess that company at HG and Associates out of Dallas, uh, on page 29, they said they'll come back and do some spot checking twice. In their contract is that during the construction they're not you know we're paying uh the construction services but anyway it comes back and it says that they'll be doing spot check and i'm, I'm hoping you know we're, we're building a, a million dollar plus facility out there and i hope somebody's coming in and doing a little bit more than just spot checking on there to to do that so as we do on all of our design contracts the architects and engineers typically are doing spot checking and we do the day-to-day -day inspections either with our inspectors or we contract with a third party to do the day-to-day -day inspections. So we're going to have a contract with third party to do the inspections? Or I what? believe on this project. We're going to do it in-house. We're going to do it in-house on this project, I believe. Okay. All right. Okay, it was just stuff that was, when I was reading the contract, it, it just kind of <laughs> jumped out to me, you know, that on there that uh, talking about you know, the civil that we're going to do it on prepared level sites. So that when they say they're going to do it on, on a prepared level site, that means somebody else is going to do the leveling out there. And I'm just assuming then uh, it's a city of Fairland going to be doing a site or we're going to hire somebody else to do it, site plan on there. So but that's, a, that's the kind of things that just come out on there. And, and then, you know, um, spot checking. <clears throat> On there, anytime you build any kind of facility, I mean, you can do the the design plans, but uh, plans on it. But then you got to go and do the deta details, especially if you're hanging any steel or anything like that. Somebody's got to go and do the details to make sure wherever it's, if it's fabricated coming out, well, then it's got to be the uh, the right size. Okay, I, I just had some questions on that. It seemed like everything that's being done is going to be done out of the state's 
uh, well, one in Dallas, it might as well be out of state. But uh, that was one of the concerns when we first had this of having somebody out of uh, Virginia and that be paying for expenses for them to fly down, you know, two or three times during a period of this contract and us picking up the expenses on it. And the same thing would be for somebody that, you know, as many design firms and civil design as we got here in the in the in the Houston area, we I, I thought you know would certainly be able to have somebody there locally, which I'd say locally within this area. But they they're out of Dallas and they have no offices in this area, so. So okay. if you have any concerns with the site design on page 28, that's got the full scope of all the civil construction documents that the civil engineer is going to do. It includes site plan, paving plan, dimension control plan, drainage area map, grading plan, storm drainage plan, water and sanitary plan design, erosion control, and the details associated with that. Yeah, and if you read so it, it'll have a other full. Whatever of the plans that the city has. Oh, and that's what they're saying here if you're going by the detail of what the, the city has as far as a you know drainage plan or what have you through there in the detail side uh, and then it says that the, you know they evaluate where the contractor is generally proceeding with in accordance with the contract and uh, to provide informed direct to the yard to be informed it is it just seems like it, some of it's pretty vague language in there and and the other side of it too, it just I, you know, even though I guess this company here had done some work up in, uh, at A and M on a facility up there, and other facilities, and probably their uh, that's their claim to fame of doing that. But I was hoping that would probably pick up somebody around here in this area locally, you know, to do the civil side, and um, not have to pay their travel if they come down here from Dallas and pay for them to come down here. That's all I have, Mayor. The contract provides for the city to appoint a project manager. Is that someone that we're going to do in-house, somebody in the engineering department or on management? Yes, sir. We'll have one of our project managers be the main point of contact between the city and the consultants. Thank you, Trent. Yes, sir. Yes, Mayor. So which company is doing the construction? I'm, I'm confused with all these names, but I don't see anywhere where it spells out who's actually doing the construction. This, this is, is the design, design work this isn't only. construction. So we don't okay, have so we contract. haven't awarded construction oh. yet. Okay, so this is just design and estimate on construction. It's just like the scores of other buildings and projects we build, same project. Okay, so the will the, the construction contract go out for bid? As opposed to a CMAR or what? You mean like the plan on this one would be go out for competitive seal proposals. Okay. Thank you. Council members, council members, have any question or comment on this item? Madam Secretary, I believe we've uh, resolved some of the questions, and we have a motion to second on the floor. Council Member Carbone, aye. Council Member Little, just to be clear, we're voting on item number six, correct? Correct. Aye. <laughs> council Member Hernandez, aye. Council Member Moore, aye. Council Member Owens, aye. Motion passes five to zero with Council Member Orlando absent in the chambers. Okay, moving in our agenda, item 18, Mayor Council issues for City Council discussion. Mayor, we need to go back to item number five. No, we need to go back to number five. We need five, to go Mayor, back so. to item five for clarification. Okay, so what you're saying? Yeah, somebody's got to introduce it. Yeah, consideration of possible action resolution number R2019-282, so moved. Second. Item number five, let me get back to it here. Yeah. Motion second on the floor, staff report. So this is the uh, contract with uh, MagnaFlow. It's the companion um, for the other part of the uh, disposal. Uh, as recommended, again, this is another renewal, so no, nothing to add. Council, have any question or comment on this item at this point? I don't hear any, so Madam Secretary, I'll be with a motion second on the floor, sitting there. Council Member Little? Aye. Council Member Hernandez? Aye. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Owens? Aye. Council Member Orlando? Aye. Council Member Carbone? 
Motion passes six to zero. Okay. As we go through the process, some of these issues are rather complex, so we uh, have to make sure we do them appropriately and properly. Moving in our agenda, item 18, which is Mayor Council issues for the City Council discussion. discussion. There were none. Item 19 is an executive session of the Texas Government Code, section 551.087. Consultation with city attorney regarding economic development negotiations. And item number two would be under executive session 551.074 personnel matters regarding appointments to the boards and commissions. Obviously, we cannot make a decision in executive session, but uh, when the council does return to open session, we will address both of those items at that time. At this time, we will we'll recess into executive session at uh, 801. It should stay green. Council had returned from executive session at uh, 9.25. Moving to new business item, uh, executive session, new business one. Consideration possible action regarding economic development. No action will be taken on this item. Consideration possible action regarding appointments to boards and commission. No action is taken on this item. Item 21 is other business, none. And uh, item 22 is an opportunity for me to adjourn this meeting, which I shall do at 925.